Let's look at the difference between a good quality gambeson and a bad quality gambeson. So, to put this into context before I go into more specific details, uh, this is the one I'm going to call our bad gambeson in my own perspective. This one is by Get Dressed for Battle and they basically have different sort of models of gambesons and things so I'm not necessarily representing all of their models but just to talk about this one in particular and how it's worse quality than the good gambeson. Uh, so this was I'd say less than half the cost of my good gambeson bearing in mind I can't remember properly because I bought this several years ago. And of course then we move on to our good gambeson and this is one by Spez. It's the sort of Axel Pettersson modelled one and it's the version 2 so it's had a couple of improvements on the older one but they're still almost identical. So this one was about £180 something like that and it's from, like I said, it's made by Spez in Poland and I'll just show you the label of that now. So these people don't tailor themselves to reenactment, they're more aimed towards people who actually do historical European martial arts, which might explain why this particular version is a more expensive and more sort of good quality gambeson, because of what the audience and what the buyers expect of such products. So, without further ado, let's have a look at the more in-depth analysis. Now with this bad gambeson, uh, you can see it's got a lace-up system. Now there's nothing inherently wrong with that, however it does mean that in between the areas getting laced up there are gaps where sword points can come in, especially since it's close to the edge and there's no kind of overlap there. So it's very easy for parts to open up, sword points and spear points can get through, other attacks can start to get around and if any of it even starts to come loose it'll it'll start to create unprotected areas. Now just before I go into actually wearing it, uh, one last thing to mention is that the padding is a lot more loose and it's a lot more broad so I end up looking a lot heavier like a, a fatter man and it's just because the padding isn't very compacted and the way it's set up in the quilts it's basically becomes a very bulky garment so trying to wear any armor on top of it is not great and it's just generally not fun to wear at all and it's pretty much only suitable as armor on its own. So with this bad gambeson it's not very good in terms of movement so for example if I was to go in something like a normal high stance where I'm using a single-handed weapon or a two-handed weapon notice I've actually tightened the, um, properly tightened the sort of, you could almost call it gorget or neck part of this and whenever I raise my arms it starts to choke me which is really not good and I have to start fighting around that so maybe I'd have to go lower, I'd have to maybe go to, into a different version like this and yes, it's certainly possible I can fight around the limitations of this gambeson but it means I'm having to force myself to do what it wants rather than it just allowing me to fight normally as I see fit. And same with trying to do things like if I was moving diagonally. It's alright if I'm like this, so because of the way it naturally stops, like I showed in the picture, it's not too bad going backwards, so if I'm doing one-handed or two-handed, actually no, not even two-handed, one-handed, behind my shoulder like this, it's perfectly fine. But if I stretch across like this, this is about as far as it goes before it starts to do that. Notice it's pulling my entire torso's worth across. Then any armour I'm wearing on top of that will start to move as well. So I'm moving my arm. It's, it's not just doing the strength of wielding a weapon, but it's also moving the gambeson, maybe moving a layer of chainmail, and moving a layer of perhaps brigandine or plate, just to pull my arm a bit further back. It's pointless. So. That's why it's really terrible in terms of flexibility. And even same if I'm going on my same shoulder, I'm using two hands. It's going to start doing that with my off hand that I'm using. It's just poor flexibility and poor manoeuvrability. Especially when everything starts to have to be adapted around this piece of armour. Almost 
even worse than you'd have with well-tailored plate armour. So I'll just quickly mention, have a look at the arms on this good Gamberson, and you'll see that naturally they rest in a position of being slightly bent. Now you'll see later on what effect this has on the movement. Now, notice that the fastening is much different on this garment. It's got a velcro and a zip, and those actually secure it better. So admittedly you might only get attacked there one time in 57, but it's still good to know that if a strike should go there, it's not going to slip past like on the bad Gamberson, and you'll still be protected, unless it actually breaks through the zip and then injures you after that. Notice too that the padding is a lot denser and a lot less just puffy. So it's good for wearing armour on top, and I have indeed already tried wearing my chainmail and brigandine on top of there, and it fits much more snugly, and it's much nicer to wear, rather than on the other gambeson. With this good gambeson, I've got plenty of movement and flexibility. It might initially look a bit weird, for example here it's inclined to raise my arms up slightly, but it's perfectly fine for resting, it doesn't strain me, and it's not important moving backwards because I'm not intending to clap my hands behind my back. It's not a realistic swordsmanship movement. So with the things that actually are swordsmanship movements, it's very good. So if I'm doing something like I'm doing one-handed or two-hands, if I'm on my shoulders, I've got plenty of movement. I can even go into more exaggerated and extreme versions of certain guards, like the guard lady back here. I can start to be quite exaggerative about pulling my garment about do the same sort of thing on the other shoulder, I can go quite deep into movement without worrying about the garment being pulled around or jerking about, and I can even go into something like with a one-handed or two-handed weapon into a higher stance. And yes, it does ride the garment up a bit, so it does start to lift slightly, you'll notice as I'm doing this with my arms, to raise, but it's not nearly as bad as in poor versions, and although it might look like this sort of gorget, neck piece, whichever you want to call it, the blade catcher, might look like it's starting to sort of choke me. Uh, to be honest, I mostly just feel it around the sort of jawline and the chin, and it doesn't really sort of choke me properly. Plus, it has the added advantage of being a proper blade catcher. So if a spear point or a sword point were to start to go along, it gives me that extra layer of defence, even if perhaps a blade or something like went underneath the bib of my mask, and in sparring, things can occasionally go under the bib of your mask. So this, this is an extra safety feature that makes it really useful as well. Plus, it's actually quite good in terms of the padding. You'll notice in some areas that don't need to move quite as much, such as here on the upper arms, that don't need to bend and flex quite as much, it's a bit more puffy and more protected. Whereas areas like here on the forearms, it's a lot more compressed and it's very good for moving around. So I've got pretty much full mo motion of movement and flexibility without any hampering and yet still got that decent protection from when I get struck. So yes, although clearly there is quite a difference in the price between the two garments that I showed, the difference in quality is equally staggering, and it's so much worth it, I find. I mean, I wore the cheaper version only about once in sparring, and was just basically fed up of it. Whereas the other version, I always enjoy to use, even if it is taking some time to get used to Gamberson's overall.